If you join me in Luke chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we can pick up in verse 21, reading down through verse 38. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. The gospel of God is a gift that keeps on giving. If you have been saved for any length of time, you would testify to that. That when you were first converted, you experienced the wonderful joy of uh, guilt being removed, of being reconciled with God, and for the first time being at peace with Him. But from that day, Many other blessings have come into your life because of the great gospel of God. As the Christmas hymn, Joy to the World, says, its blessings flow as far as the curse is found. When the gospel arrives, there are many, many blessings to come, not only in our lives, but for generations to come. Well, this passage this morning highlights the truth that the gospel keeps on giving, not only in our lifetime, but long after. But to really understand what's taking place in this passage, you need to remember the context of all of this. Jesus Christ, Messiah, has been born. And this long-promised announcement of the good news has, uh, has come to pass. And we saw that last week. The shepherds have heard uh, about this Christ, the Son of God, being born in Bethlehem. And so these shepherds make the journey to Bethlehem, to the the home of the great King David, and they meet the true shepherd king, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful scene of these shepherds who leave their lambs to go and to find the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These shepherds, in many ways, are the first evangelists, They're the first pastors, as it will, those who are shepherding God's flock and proclaiming this wonderful message. But now in our text this morning, eight, it's eight days later, and we see Joseph and Mary and Jesus 
Jesus being circumcised. It's the first time that Jesus Christ will shed blood for his people. This will be the first time that Jesus Christ will experience pain, will experience suffering for those that he came to ransom. 32 days after the circumcision, we find Joseph and Mary offering the customary sacrifice, which we'll look at in a moment. But while they're there, something very um, amazing, almost disconcerting happens where a man by the name of Simeon comes and takes the child and begins to praise God and to give a wonderful announcement that in this baby Jesus, he is seeing the salvation of God. He's been anticipating this for most of his, his life. And now, finally, it has come to pass. But as he embraces the Lord Jesus Christ, he's also anticipating greater blessings for the future. And, he, and, and, and as he breaks out in praise, he gives, gives an explanation to Joseph and Mary what this is all about. And then later on, a lady by the name of Anna comes in, also an old saint. She's 84 years of age, at least. And as she comes in, she also realizes that finally this long-awaited promise has come to pass. But she knows that with the coming of this promise, there are many blessings to be anticipated. And so she begins to speak of him, verse 38, to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. In this passage, we're going to see something about the good news anticipated. The already blessings and the not yet blessings still to come. It's a pretty simple passage to outline. In verses uh, 21 to uh, 35, we have Simeon's trust. We have a man by the name of Simeon who is trusting the Lord. And in verses 36 to 38, we have Anna's testimony. Let's begin by looking at this man, Simeon. But to understand him, we have to understand the context of this. The context of, of this man, Simeon, is within the faithful obedience of this royal family. Look with me at verse 21, where we see the devotion of this family to the law of God. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So eight days have passed, and in terms of uh, the law of God in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12, in, in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, this son needs to be circumcised. And so on the eighth day, they carry out this procedure. We don't know where it was done. Perhaps there was a synagogue in Bethlehem. Perhaps it was done in the home. But on this eighth day, the Lord Jesus Christ was circumcised. And that's an amazing, an amazing demonstration again of the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because circumcision was a sign of the coming Redeemer. It was a sign of the need for our sins to be removed. The Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. Yet he underwent this, this legal procedure to, to be able to identify with sinners. And as he is circumcised, he is given his name. That was always happening on the eighth day of a son, after a son's birth, given the name Jesus. Naming someone is an act of dominion. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, God says to Adam, you are to name the animals. And the reason for that was God had already said that Adam and Eve were going to have dominion over all of life on the earth. And so as a, as a demonstration of that rulership, of that dominion, Adam named the animals. Well, I don't know about you, but we didn't let our kids name themselves. Uh, we named them. Although one day I remember we were saying to Allison, Allison, would you like to be called Allison or Allie? And she said, I'd like to be called Susan. <laughs> we didn't allow that were the parents. We took dominion. We gave her this name. But it's interesting here, the name Jesus was given to this child, not because of Joseph and Mary, but because the angel had said that is his name. And there's just a really wonderful principle here, 
that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, we get a new ruler. God gets to make the rules. God is the one who's telling us what to do. And so already from the start, they know that this child is different. He is named Jesus because of the angels. But we see further the, this family committed, dedicated, devoted to God. Because in verse 22 it says, When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses. You read about this law in Leviticus chapter 12 where God had explained through Moses that when a woman gave birth to a male child, after 40 days, they were to dedicate this child to the Lord. And they do that, and it was for, by the way, their purification, which signals right away that when a child comes in the world, though it is something to be celebrated, it's also a reminder that the sin nature is still continuing in this world. That here's a child who has been born with a sin nature, and in a real sense, this child comes into the world with a death penalty upon them. And it was interesting that in, in Exodus chapter 13, after the Exodus, and God took the sons of the, of the Egyptians, the firstborn, he would take the firstborn son of anyone who didn't have the blood over their door. After that, God said, here's my law. From now on, the firstborn son that is born, he is to be offered to me. And it's a whole picture of that judgment, God bringing judgment upon the sons because of sin. But God said, you don't need to offer your firstborn son as a sacrifice to me. Rather, you can offer a sacrifice in his place. And Leviticus 12 calls for that. They were to bring a lamb. They were to bring a lamb and sacrifice this lamb in the place of the firstborn son. And they were also to sacrifice a pigeon or a turtle dove. But God said, I understand that some of you are poor. And you're not going to be able to, to afford a lamb. And if you can't do that, then you can offer two pigeons or two turtle doves. It's interesting. This sacrifice shows us Joseph and Mary were poor. They come to the temple. And they bring their sacrifice for their firstborn son. I find that amazing, again, because Jesus Christ is sinless. And yet they are obeying the law of God. Remember that God gave the law of God, by the way, to point us to Jesus Christ. So even this very law in Leviticus 12 and in Exodus 13 about the firstborn being offered to God but a sacrifice in its place, we see this pointing to Jesus Christ that actually though in this case God's not going to offer a sacrifice in place of his son, he's going to actually offer his son for you and I. We see the love and the grace and the mercy of God here. They bring their offering they, according to the law of the Lord. Look down at verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And later on, he speaks in verse 39 about the law of the Lord. Verse 22, he spoke about the law of Moses. Joseph and Mary obey the law of God. And by extension, Jesus Christ is obeying that law. You say, why is that important? Because Galatians 4.4 4 says this, that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Sproul says this, that from the very beginning of Jesus' life, he was dedicated in every detail to the commandments of God. And thank God for that, because Jesus Christ, from his birth until his death, perfectly obeyed the law of God so we could be freed from the curse of the law. Well, while they're carrying out this ordinance of the Lord, in verse 25 it says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. He was a man who was just. The word devout speaks of, of piety. That it's an interesting word. It literally means to be careful. He was very careful about the law of the Lord. He was very careful about his walk with the Lord. And he was doing all of this waiting for the consolation of 
Israel. The word consolation speaks of comfort, of course. And the rabbis um, would oftentimes speak of Messiah as being the consolation of Israel. Because Israel was going through dark times, and they knew that once Messiah came, as he would come, he would be a comfort to them. And this is what Simeon is waiting for. He is waiting for Messiah to arrive. The word waiting speaks of endurance. It's used in Luke chapter, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 43, speaking of Joseph of Arimathea, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. Jude speaks of it in Jude 21, about us waiting for the mercy of the Lord as returns. Paul uses it in Titus 2.13, speaking about the fact that we are waiting for the blessed hope. This, this man is waiting, not sitting on his hands, but he is waiting with expectation for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting. He believes God that the consolation of Israel is going to come. And the reason for that was verse 26. Because it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Three times we read about the third member of the Godhead in this passage the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. I was saying it to my family yesterday. It's interesting how often the Holy Spirit shows up in the Christmas story. And the reason for that is the Holy Spirit has come to earth to bring glory to our Savior. And so when you read the Christmas story, the Holy Spirit is all over the story because he loves to point people to Jesus. Well, the Spirit of God had revealed at some point to Simeon that you will not die until you lay your eyes upon the Lord's Christ. This man had a personal revelation from God the Holy Spirit that he would physically see Messiah. He had God's word on it, if you will. And because of that, he is waiting with expectation. And so on this particular day, he comes in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents bring the child Jesus to do for him, according to all that we've just talked about, he takes him up in his arms. I don't know about you, but when our kids were very young, I was always uncomfortable when particularly strange, would come and want to take our children. I don't mean take them, pick them up. Um, and people just sometimes feel like a baby is public property. And so you're holding a baby and they just come and they just say, can I hold the baby? And usually I would say something like, ask her mother. <laughs> Here is Joseph and Mary in the temple. They have performed the sacrifices and all of a sudden, some man by the name of Simeon, some strange man, comes up and he actually takes the child from them. And he blesses God. And he breaks out with this incredible celebration about this child. Think about Simeon. We don't know how old he is. We oftentimes think of Simeon as an old man. And though the text doesn't tell us that, the whole tenor of the passage, particularly contrasting with Anna, would make me think that Simeon's been doing this for a long time. Perhaps in his, in, in his, as a young adult, the Lord had said to him, Simeon, you're going to see Messiah before you die. And so maybe it's been many, many years. And every day, Simeon comes to the temple. And he's walking around. And he's looking around. And maybe people would say to him, Simeon, what are you looking for? I'm looking for Messiah. I'm looking for Christ the Lord because the Lord told me that I'm going to see him. And I would imagine that many people would say, yes, Simeon, you've been telling us that for years and years and years. Do you think it's possible, Simeon, that maybe you misunderstood? Do you think it's possible that maybe you misheard and you are misinterpreting this. And Simeon would say, no, it's not. I am waiting for the consolation of Israel because God has promised. God is a faithful God and he's promised me this. And so I am here looking for him. It's interesting how Malachi, in Malachi chapter 3, speaks about the fact that the messenger of the Lord, speaking of Messiah, will suddenly appear in the temple. 
And I wonder if this isn't a kind of a reference to that. That all of a sudden, suddenly, here's Joseph and Mary. They come in with this baby. And Simeon, who comes in the, the, into the temple in the spirit, is able to make the connection, this baby, baby is Messiah. Now, now understand this. When Simeon was given the promise he would see the Lord's Messiah, we don't know what that entailed. But I, I, I really wonder whether Simeon was expecting to see a baby. Perhaps he was expecting to see the full-grown Messiah. But as he sees this couple, the Holy Spirit that he is filled with, makes it clear to him, this baby, you've seen lots of babies here, Simeon, who have come with their parents, and they've undergone the ceremonial purification. But this one is different, and the Spirit of God enables Simeon to see he is Jesus. Again, I don't want to belabor the point, but a part of me does want to belabor the point that apart from the Spirit of God, no man can say, Jesus is Lord. The only reason that we understand who Jesus Christ is is not because we're, we're more clever than that Muslim person or that Hindu person or that atheistic person. We understand it because of the wonderful ministry of the Spirit of God who has opened our eyes to see He is Jesus and He is Lord. Simeon makes the connection. This is Messiah. He takes him up in his arms and he blesses God. He is praising God. And he says, Lord. And, and by the way, this is a, a very rare word in, in the original language for Lord. It, it's the word we get our word despot from. It speaks of the supreme sovereign ruler. Supreme sovereign ruler who has given me a promise. Now you are letting your servant depart in peace. That phrase, to depart is a word that was used in the ancient world to speak of a prisoner that was let go. And there's a sense in which Simeon was just waiting for this day when he would see Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, then he knew he was ready to die. And can I say this to you? You're not ready to die until you see Jesus. Until the Spirit of God opens your eyes for you to see that Jesus Christ was not just a man, he was the God-man. That he is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. When you see that and you embrace him, then you are ready to die. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. I've been waiting for this consolation of Israel. I have been waiting for Jesus. Now I've seen him. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Let's spend a couple of moments here because there's something very interesting about this. There's a sense of anticipation uh, throughout the whole Christmas story in Luke chapter 1 as John the Baptist is uh, pronounced that he's going to be born. And there's this anticipation that the forerunner of Jesus is going to come into this world. Then the Gabriel comes and says to Mary, you're going to conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to bring forth Messiah. You're going to bring forth the Son of God. And there's this anticipation for nine months. And then the child is born and the shepherds come and, 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 and they then make this known that Christ has come. In this scene, Simeon's been anticipating this day for a long time, most likely. And as it comes to pass, it's interesting that his, antici his anticipation breaks forth into celebration. He says, Lord, now I see. I've seen the one. Praise you, God. I bless your holy name, God, that you were faithful to your promise, and I have seen him. But it's interesting that with the celebration, there's even more anticipation. Because he says this, my eyes have seen your salvation, that you are prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. None of that has happened yet when he said this. But Simeon can make the connection and say that if God had promised the Messiah would come, 
and particularly promised me that I would see him. And Messiah has come, and I have seen him. Then I know all those promises like Psalm 96. What a fitting psalm for the day, for the week. Psalm 96, praising God for the fact that his glory, his salvation, will be made known among all the nations. None of that had happened, but Simeon knew if God has kept this promise, he will keep that promise. Can I encourage you, Christian, that there are many blessings that we have initially when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. When we come to the point in our life where we realize that we have sinned against holy God, but that God has sent his Son to live the perfect life we could not live, and we realize that he died our death in our place, that he experienced the wrath of God for us, and when we realize by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ rose again for our justification, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, already we have the great blessing of justification. We have the great blessing that we are accepted in the beloved, but there are many blessings still to come. There's the blessing of glorification. One day, and I hope it's sooner than later, one day, I'm going to be sinless. One day I'm going to die. And some are thinking sooner than later. One day I'm going to die. And one day Christ is going to come back. And I'm going to rise from the dead. And I am going to be glorified. And you know how I know that? I know that for the future because I know the truth of the past. Because of the cross of Christ. Because of his work done there when he said, it is finished. And because when he saved me 30, 40 years ago, when he saved me and he transformed my life, he justified me. That is a guarantee that what he's done in the past, he's going to fulfill in the future. And if you're a Christian, you have the same promise. There's so many gospel blessings that we enjoy in this life, and thank God for those. But all of those are simply, in a sense, a down payment of the future. Paul will speak in Ephesians twice about the, the redemption of our bodies. And he says, we know the redemption of our bodies. We know one day that we will be resurrected and we will be glorified. There will be no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sin. We know that because God has redeemed us in the past. Simeon said, God has been faithful thus far. That's why we sang that song today, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Because we need to be reminded of the great faithfulness of God if God spared not his own son for us, Paul says, how shall I not also with him for give us all things? Simeon said, I can leave now because I have seen your salvation and I know what you're going to do in the future. Can I just say this, Christian? There, there's something here I think that's very significant. You know, one of the frustrations I was taking this week about preaching this series, it's been the most frustrating series I've ever preached. And the reason it's frustrating is there's so much here. And there's so much I have to just skip over. I'd love to just park here and, and preach each of these verses for a long time. But the day has to end. But it's interesting here that Simeon is thinking about other generations. He's thinking about the future. He's not just thinking about his own gospel blessings. He is thinking about future generations. He's thinking about all the Gentiles who are going to be hearing this gospel. He's thinking about all the nations that will be reached and will be around the throne of God, praising God for the Lamb, his Son. He's thinking about the future when Israel will experience the glory as Romans 11 makes very clear. What we have here is a man who's not just thinking about his present gospel blessings, his personal gospel blessings. He's thinking about the glory of God for generations. He's thinking about the welfare of generations. That's how we're supposed to live. It's not just about what we get out of this. We're preparing for the future. Simeon, holding this child, breaking forth in this celebration. And now you have his father and his mother who are marveling, verse 33, at what was said about him. They were wondering about this. There's no doubt that they're somewhat startled. And keep that in mind, though Joseph and Mary believe the promises, they're progressing in their understanding. They've had, uh, Mary's had the experience with Elizabeth. 
They've had the experience with the shepherds. They now have this experience with a stranger by the name of Simeon making this declaration and they're, they're, they're marveling about this. Perhaps at this point, Simeon hands Jesus back to them and as he does so, he blesses them. And he then says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. Forget the parentheses right here. Let me finish this statement. For a sign that is opposed so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. They've heard this praising from Simeon. That this child, the child of theirs, is God's salvation. That this child of theirs is going to be a light, a revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of God's people Israel. And now Simeon hands the child back. And Simeon gives this, this prophecy. And says to Mary, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And many are going to oppose him. He says, this child... Through this child, the thoughts from many hearts are going to be revealed. In other words, this son of yours is going to be the dividing line of, of history. This child of yours is going to be the dividing line of humanity. That when it comes to this child, there's going to be no neutrality. People are either going to be for him or they're going to be against him. In fact, his very presence in this world is going to become the dividing line between humanity. And he says this... Somewhat strange statement at this point, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. He's saying to Mary, this child is a blessing. This child is a revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. This child is going to be a blessing. With this child, with this child is also going to come opposition. With this child is going to come conflict. And with this child is going to come pain for you yourself. What kind of pain was that? I can only imagine this is the kind of pain that she, that, that she would experience at the cross. In fact, the word sword here doesn't mean one of those short, short Roman so, uh, swords. It means a longer spear. Remember when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and they took a spear and thrust it into his side. And when they thrust that spear into the side of Jesus, here is Mary watching her son suffer for hours on the cross. And then she sees as that spear was thrust into his side, there is no doubt that as that happened, there was one through her own soul also. It's this cross work of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the dividing line of humanity. Jesus Christ had to be born he had to come as a baby. But it wasn't his, as, as a baby that becomes the dividing line for humanity. It's his cross work. It's the cross that reveals, that is revealing for each of us. It reveals our hearts. If we spurn the cross, it reveals that we're opposed to him. But as we embrace his work on the cross, it reveals that we are for him. Simeon looks into the eyes, the face of the six-week-old child. He sees something of this future. I was recently looking into the eyes of some nine-week-old children and just praying and asking God, please save these little girls at the earliest age and please, God, give them a godly forever family. And as I looked into their eyes and was praying, I, I began to imagine one day going as a guest to their wedding and watching them walk down the aisle. Maybe they get married the same day. They walk down the aisle, marrying godly men. I pray that's true. And then they raise a godly seed. I pray that's true, but I don't have any guarantee of that. But when Simeon looked in the eyes of the six-week-old child, he had a guarantee this is going to happen. That this, 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 this baby is Messiah. 
He's going to come. And he's going to die for sinners. And there's going to be many people who believe on him. And as the text says, they will, they, they will be rising up. Others will reject him and they will fall. They will stumble. We read about him, uh, being, the, uh, about him being the cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2 today. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And some will stumble over him and fall for eternity. And others will fall before him in repentance and faith and be raised to newness of life. I hope that's you. If it's not you, then today is the day for you to embrace the Savior who grew to be a man and who died on the cross for sinners and rose from the dead so we could rise with him as well. Simeon trusted God. But the passage ends with another old saint by the name of Anna, and we see her testimony. There was this prophetess. That's interesting, by the way, because prophetesses were very rare in the Old Testament. There's a few mentioned in the New Testament. But keep in mind, as I've mentioned on several occasions, God has been silent for 400 years, and now as God, in a sense, begins to speak, it's a woman. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And the Bible tells us she was advanced in years. And depending on the translation, there's some debate about this. It's either saying that she lived 84 years as a widow, or she was 84 years at this point. But regardless, she was an old woman. And all of her years, she did not depart, verse 37, from the temple. She's worshiping with fasting and prayers night and day. And as she comes this particular day, maybe she had a, a room in the temple, that's possible. And as she comes to the temple that day, and as she's worshiping God, and as she's praying, perhaps she knew Simeon, probably did. He probably came there just as often. He came there because he was coming and looking for Jesus. Where is he? Is he here today? And maybe she had said that, maybe he had said that to Anna. And one day Anna's there, and she looks up, and here is Simeon holding this child. And she hears Simeon get this wonderful declaration that this baby is Messiah. And so immediately she begins to give thanks to God. And then she begins to speak to all of those who were waiting for the redemption of Israel, Jerusalem. This is the same kind of terminology as the consolation of Israel. She was waiting for the day when God would gloriously come to Jerusalem and make a difference there. I don't think Anna understood all about the new Jerusalem that would come down out of heaven. She didn't understand about the new Jerusalem, which is the church of the living God, but she believed God's promise this Messiah would come, and he's come, and she's praising God for that, and she's speaking to him, to all who are waiting for redemption. Like Simeon, she's faithfully waited on the Lord all these years, and now it comes to pass. I love this. She was in the right place at the right time to experience Jesus. She's there on this particular day, and in the sovereignty of God, he's ordained all these things to come to pass so she can take part in this great blessing as she begins to speak to him. As I wrap this up, can I make a couple of very important points of application? First of all, from Anna's life, let's remember that if by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been enabled to see the identity of Jesus Christ, we've been able to enable by the power of the Spirit of God to see that Jesus Christ is Lord and to see that he is our Savior, then like Anna, let's speak about that to others. There are others who may not even realize it, but they are waiting for this to happen. But secondly, like Simeon, Anna, let's persevere and faithfully wait upon what God has yet promised to do. Both these saints, the word waiting is used to describe them. They are looking with anticipation for God to fulfill his promise. We as Christians, we have many promises. Let's look with great anticipation for those promises to come to pass. We pray every week for unreached countries. We do that not to just fill some kind of a time slot. We do that because we believe the word of God promises that there will be people saved from every tribal group, every nation, every kindred, every tongue around the globe. And we believe God's word, do we not? And therefore, we pray for that. 
And we sacrificially give to, to, to send missionaries to, to, to these very people. Let's not lose our steadfastness. Let's not lose our perseverance. Let Simeon and Anna be wonderful models for us of those who believe the promise of God. And though we experience many in this lifetime, there are many that are going to happen long after us. Let's live for that. Which is my third and last point. Let's, go, let's, let's grow old well. Let's grow old well. It's a wonderful thing to see young people follow the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to see young people become excited about serving Him. But I've been here for 25 years and I've seen many, many young people fall away. It's sad. No one ever leaves or doesn't break my heart. But it's wonderful to be in a church for a long time and see some people just growing older and older in grace and glory. They're still here. They're still faithfully serving the Lord. I met with a couple of people in our church this week who are in their 70s. And in both times, I went away just greatly encouraging, encouraged in my spirit, realizing here are some older saints that in spite of all the heartaches they've gone through, in spite of all the suffering they've gone through, they're faithfully trusting Jesus. They're faithfully serving. They're faithfully growing. They're faithfully learning. They're faithfully trusting Him. That's an example for us all. Can I just be quite frank? I am weary to the bone of hearing 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds telling me that it's time for them to step away from a ministry to give somebody younger another chance. Can I say this? If you're in your 30s or 40, you're young. Trust me. Really. And I'm not the only one. I talk to pastors and there's this thing when people get into their 40s where we're going to step aside and let the younger generation look at Simeon and Anna and then tell me that. Here are Simeon and Anna, and Anna, particularly Anna, 84 years of age at least, every day in the temple serving God. We don't retire from serving God. We might change the, the shape of our ministry. We might go to another place to minister. I understand that. There might be some other ministry God moves us into within the church. We don't just sit back on our hands. We, we look at the God, people like Simeon and Anna who believe the gospel. And they believe the promises. And because they believe the promises, they kept serving. You're never too old to serve. In fact, I would suggest to you, the older you are, the better equipped you should be to serve. And the, old, and the younger people looking at the older ones, and the older ones mentoring the younger ones to serve, to serve, to serve. What a wonderful thing to serve until we drop dead. I have, I have, I have read many accounts of pastors preaching, and, and as they preached, they, they died in the pulpit. Now that would be perhaps traumatic for the congregation. It might not be for some, but for, for many it would be traumatic. But that's what you call dying with your boots on. When Brackenridge Baptist Church buries you, make sure you leave a big gap in the ministry. What I mean by that is that when you die, you're missed because like Simeon and Anna, you were faithfully waiting on the Lord. The gospel. Simon and Anna, again, in both cases. Here's Anna, 84 years of age. What's she doing? He's, she's speaking to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. It wasn't just about her and her own generation. It was about the ones to come. Simeon's praising God because of the Gentiles that will be saved and the glory of Israel in the future. Not just think, I remember Eddie Lear once said to us, we ought to plant some trees here in the, in the parking lot. And I can remember self, this was years ago, selfishly thinking, well, we can plant those trees, but where am I going to get the shade? Because it's going to be a long time before we, those trees are, are, are bearing enough shade for all the cars. And, and, and it just struck me how what Eddie was saying is, let's think about the future generation. Let's think about those who come after us. 
You know why we need to faithfully serve God in Brackenhurst Baptist Church now? Why we need to faithfully give and serve and pray and gather is not just for us, but for the next generation. So the next generation, little ones right now that are in the, in the creche, and the creche workers are, are praying, even so, come Lord Jesus. How long, O oh Lord? <laughs> Thinking about them. Does that make sense? Simeon and Anna, concerned. They embraced the gospel. They embraced this good news in their own life, but they were thinking about those who come after. So may we grow well by growing graciously in this glorious gospel that we celebrate today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this good news that was announced. Thank you for this good news that was affirmed. Thank you for this good news of the gospel that arrived long ago. And thank you for good news still yet to be anticipated. Our children and our grandchildren being converted. And generations around the world being converted and the nations being brought in. And one day Israel, in mass, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then even more Gentiles being saved after that. Thank you, Lord, that though there's so many wonderful blessings in the already, they're still wonderful in the not yet. And help us like Simeon and Anna to wait in the meantime to faithfully persevere, to faithfully fast and pray and to worship, to anticipate as we gather together with the temple of God, looking for Jesus. As Simeon went to the old temple looking for Jesus, may we gather each week looking and finding him afresh. Lord, I do pray you'd help us as a church to, to grow old well. Thank you for the many examples sitting here this morning in this congregation decades of faithful service in this place. No doubt facing hard times where they wanted to walk away. Facing hard times where their faith was challenged and yet by your grace they persevered and they serve as examples to us. And Lord, as they are ready to depart, we pray that you'd help us to learn from their examples that we too would be ready to depart one day. And so Lord, hear our prayer today for our church. We would increasingly be Christ-centered, increasingly gospel-centered. And Lord, that you would build this church for generations to come, for your honor and for your glory. Lord, would you please today save those amongst us that have not yet seen Christ as Lord. Holy Spirit, would you give them new hearts to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Enable them today to be able to say from their heart of hearts, Christ is Lord. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.